guys, what is up? It's the second episode of the J&J Hockey Podcast. Pedersen 40 hosting with my friend for the first time live, Josiah. Hi. How you doing? Good. So you'll notice the sound quality is better as the first episode was over phone. We'll have to do that most of the time, but he happens to be here today. So the sound quality will be better, and that's good because we got a one and a really good episode for you guys today. Okay, so we will be talking today mostly about the coronavirus outbreak. I don't know how we could not. We're a hockey podcast. Uh, We're also going to be talking about Henry Richard's death, the controversy of 93, the missed call of Carrie Fraser. That's the controversy of 93. And then an interesting hockey story about the, uh, the Rangers. So Josiah will lead us off here about the coronavirus. Hi, so the NHL closed down last Thursday after an NBA player got the coronavirus. And so, yeah, they haven't decided. The NHL has not started up again, obviously. We don't know when they will. This whole season maybe may go down the drain, or maybe we'll have hockey in July this summer. See what happens. But yeah, it's just kind of a, a, yeah, like an outbreak, but anyways. Yeah, so a complete list of all the leads that were canceled was LPG, was the LPGA, which is a women's golf league, NLL, so lacrosse, NHL, obviously, NBA, MLB, and MIS, so hockey, basketball, baseball, and soccer. Various tennis tournaments, like the Miami Open. Uh, the Olympics are barely hitting on, uh, as they refuse to close them in Japan. Uh, the NCAA, and with it March Madness. AHL, CHL, KHL. Uh, the next two races of NASCAR. High school band spectators for all of their sports. Uh, Premier League, which is uh, international, more international soccer. Figure Skating Championship, IIHF Tournaments, World Cup Skiing, Boston Marathon, Swiss Tournaments. Uh, At horse racing, there is no food, drinks, wagering, and their next race is no spectators. Uh, The XFL, which is football, and the NFL is closely monitoring. Draft is still uh, going on, and the regular season is supposed to start as scheduled, and men's golf is without spectators. Hmm. So that list took me a minute and a half to go through. So that just shows how just how badly sports has been affected by the coronavirus. It I'd be hard pressed to think of a major league except like the CHL and the NBA G League was also canceled. I forgot to name that. And then there are probably other leagues I'm missing as well. The only league I could think of that probably wasn't canceled or that I didn't put on there was the CF was the CFL. I'm not sure what's going on with that. I think their season is over right now, so there's nothing. Right, yeah, yeah. The season doesn't start till like next fall, and it should oh. probably be blown over by then. So. Well, and that's yeah, the, it'll it should be. I hope it's. I hope it is. Yeah. So let's imagine what's going to happen here. So some people are guessing that it's going to be early May the NHL comes back, and then other people July. What do you think, Josiah? I don't know. I was I looked at uh, NHL.com and. They'll, they say they'll start it as prudent or as soon as it makes sense to start it up again. Yeah, Bettman said that he just, it was unacceptable to continue playing games as, or right after Rudy Gobert spread it to Donovan Mitchell uh, on the Utah Jazz in the NBA. That kind of set everything off. Yeah, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense. It doesn't make sense why you can't just play without spectators. Because, I mean, think about it. The Players don't want to play without spectators. That, I guess that, I guess, yeah. I, I mean, <clears throat> spectators fuel the players when they're on the ice. It's like, I can't imagine, like, e- even peewee hockey has fans in the stands. Like, parents yeah, and the only, but family. The only stuff. people that would be happy with those spectators is the refs. Because, you know. It, like, they get booed a lot, yeah, sure. Like, in my, I, was, I went to a game in Montreal, and when the refs make a call for the Montreal Canadiens to get a penalty, the whole crowd just boos them. Yeah, so that's that's how that works. Yeah, yeah. So I think the NHL is going to be back in 
July. You didn't really I could agree with that, but they might even the whole season might even go down the drain. They might not even play. But. It could. I think they'll resume at some point. It would just be pretty tough because if you think about it, say the NHL season goes to July, right? Then not only does that pass the entry draft, it also passes free agency. So now you gotta think like, does the draft and free agency go to August? Is that when they would do it? Well, they don't. Uh, if if they do start the season in July or the end of June, they wouldn't do the whole season though. They well, they might not play out the season, but the playoffs take at least a month for sure. Yeah. So what you could do is you could have, um, you could just play like say I think the highest amount of games a certain a team has played is seventy one. So then just have every single team play it up to 71 games, and then just play the playoffs that way. That seems right. to be the best way. Yeah, it, and, it, and it would, because some teams have played more than others in the regular season, which is why that would work. But well, what do you think would happen to Fragile Team? Do you think they would still have it on July 1st? Because that would make it a problem, because there was less regular season games. No, I say you ditch the preseason. That kind of has to happen. Preseason? Gonna have, the preseason, yeah. Because the players have to oh, have right. some sort of yeah. break. You can't True. just, like... Well, they would have the rest of August. Well, the playoffs takes about two months. So then you would have all of September. I say that you make the free agents... Well, I say that I say that you postpone the start of the regular season. If they go all the way to August... That's, yeah, I guess. So. I say that you postpone the start of the regular season. To the start of November. You make the, the draft, like, sometime in September. Free agency is sometime in September. And then See, the, the game, the season doesn't start until November. The thing is, the thing is, is that no one knows exactly how this is gonna work because no, like this has never happened in the NHL. I mean, the Spanish flu was the last time we had a pandemic like this, and it, the Spanish flu was more much worse. Was much worse. Yeah, it killed a few players. I don't. It killed their fifty words. to hundred million people or something in the world. Right. So obviously, the coronavirus is. Not going How to dangerous that. would the coronavirus be to athletes? Not at all. I don't think any ath athletes would just get. It's just like a bad. Really, it's just like a bad cold. Yeah. So like, nothing's really gonna. The players probably have great immune systems, so probably nothing would really happen to them. They'd probably be fine. Yeah, it definitely. So if it wouldn't affect them at all, though, then why can't they just like? I get that they, but I, I get that they might not want to play without spectators. Like, even LeBron James went as far as saying he wouldn't play at all. But at the same time, would you rather this? I don't know. Rather this or... Rather this or what's happening right... Or would you rather this or just continue playing without spectators? Yeah, I mean... Continue playing with those spectators, especially for the people that watch it or listen to the games, because that doesn't really affect them at all. Well, and it also just makes it made sense not to delay it any more than it has to be. I get that, like obviously, then you miss a year, then you miss a ton of revenue as the NHL because yeah. they don't have fans in the seats, and so they don't, and so the fans obviously don't have to pay for seats they can't occupy. Yeah. So maybe make the fans just pay for it anyways. No. <laughs> Yeah, so that that's that's personally what I think. I think it's gonna start in July. I think we'll um, make sure that every team has played the same amount of games. We'll do the playoffs. We'll have the draft and then free agency, and then we'll delay the regular season. What do you think? Yeah, I could agree with that. Okay, so uh, next we will move on to Henry Richard. But remember to wash your hands and. Um, don't touch your face. And cough, make sure you cough on your friends. No, don't do that. <laughs> okay, so another a more huge news that happened lately in the NHL was a legend died, uh, Maurice Richard's younger brother, Henry Richard, or the Pocket Rocket. Oh, they called him the Pocket Rocket? Yeah, they do call him the Pocket Rocket. I thought they called his brother the Pocket Rocket. No, he was just the Rocket. Uh, he, he's called Pocket Rocket because he was only, what does it say here, 5'7 and 160 Oof. rounds. So the joke was that he could fit pounds. in pockets. Yeah. Not 160 rounds. <laughs> pounds. Uh, yeah. So he was a 
excellent player who is in the Hall of Fame. His best is the he actually owns a record in the NHL, and it's a great one that emphasizes the word winner. He has 11 Stanley Cups as a player, which is the, the record. Jean Beliveau has 17, but uh, that was 8 as a player and 9 as an executive, I think. So he has the most Stanley Cup reigns overall, but Henry Richard won the most as a player. So that shows just how good the Canadians were uh, between 1955 and 1975, which were their two best eras. So he kind of got a little bit lucky being around that. Cause yeah, because he played with his brother, who's one of the best players of all two. time. True, but he also got to play with greats like Jean Beliveau, Guy Lafleur, um, uh, Guy Lapointe, Serge Guy Savard, um, like stu guys like that. Guy Lafleur? I don't think he ever played with Guy Lafleur. No, think about oh, it. Oh, yeah. 74, 75. 71. I mean, he, I mean, he could have. Guy Lafleur came in in like 71, so he played with Guy Lafleur for a few years. But, you know, that was when he was going down. Still. Yeah. Uh, so... So that emphasizes on um, how good the team was, but also how good he was. In his career, he had uh, 358 goals, 688 assists, and for, for 1,046 points over 1,258 games in 20 years. Between, as I said before, the 55-56 season and the 1974-75 season. He was 19 when he started and 38 when he ended. And he was a plus 243 in his career, he was actually never a minus in his career in a season. The lowest he got was a plus two, and the highest was a plus thirty-three. Except they're not showing his first four seasons, so maybe he they was like, they didn't hold they didn't hold stats for that. Maybe he was like minus fifty in his first four seasons. Uh, his best no, year, no, his best year in terms of points was eighty. Eighty goals, so that's fifty-two assists, twenty-eight assists and in his third year. That he also won the Bing and the Hart Trophy in that year too. So and he also yeah. won, so he won a he won two Lady Bings, a Calder Trophy, a Hart Trophy, a, or no two Hart Trophies and a Bill Masterton Trophy in his career. And a Calder, Calder, and a Calder. As well, I said, you can only win one Calder. <laughs> <laughs> yep. It's not like you can win six. Otherwise, the NHL would be rigged or something. So Richard was really a determined little player. That's definitely for sure. Yeah, the only thing it looks like he could have worked on was the shorthanded goals. He only scored one shorthanded goal, but you know what? That's all good because he made up for it. He was know. actually, when he was young, he never expected to play in the NHL, but yeah. he decided that he would try anyway. And on and like many players even today, although it's getting better, uh, Henry Richard, it was worried that he couldn't handle the pace of the game, but especially the physicality. Huh. He definitely proved them wrong. Well, yeah, just like the what's that guy's name on? Alex Lebrinkat? No, on Columbus, 5'4". Uh, I don't know. I don't know his name. Anyways, he got into a fight with a big guy, and I think he won or something. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so we he was an excellent guy who had a Hall of Fame career filled with lots of points, lots of awards, and most importantly, lots of cups. Um, we wish the Richard family well, if there is any left. Yeah. I know his brother died. His parents are probably dead. I don't know if Andre or Maurice had any friends. Oh, wait! Uh, I have a friend. He said Maurice Richard, which would also mean Andre Richard, was like his great, great, or one of his uncles or something, related okay. to him somehow. Which could be true, because his family is, uh, he is... French, bilingual, he speaks French and English. Anyways. Okay, so we wish Andre Richard well. Andre Richard. I just said that. Andre Richard and, and or Henry, whatever you want to call him. And then Henry was 84 when he died. Yep. And he had Alzheimer's, so. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so next we are going to move on to the controversy of 93. If you don't know that, and any Leafs fan or Kings fan would, that's for sure, yeah. and Kerry Fraser would. So Kerry Fraser was, and in my opinion, the greatest referee of all time, and in a lot of people's opinion. Uh, he was on, he was a referee that night. The Leafs were up 3-2 to two in the conference finals in 1993 on the Canes, and momentum was really swinging the Leafs' way. When... 
suddenly, uh, in, uh, uh, as Gretzky says in his book, 99 Stories About the Game, when I accidentally clipped Duddy Gilmore on the chin in game sets overtime, was it a penalty? Probably. It was a tie game when Glenn Anderson, who is now with the Leafs, tried to run Rob Blake through the boards from behind. He got a charging penalty. At the faceoff, the putt seemed to stall, and I took a shot that deflected off J uh, Jamie McCoon's shin pad and bounced back to the faceoff circle. I went over behind Gilmore, and we both went for the puck. He went over, grabbed his chin, and the play stopped. The rule back then was that you were in charge of your stick. Even if a guy skated into it, you got a five-minute pe penalty. So when Kerry Fraser, and Kerry Fraser says this in his butt too, Dougie Gilmore said it, it was my follow-through that clipped him, so the puck hit him. So, which meant that there's no high sticking infraction, and so Fraser told him that meant no call. So, and as Gretzky says here, people often asked him if he felt bad for the Leafs. It said, you know what, in those playoffs, Dougie got a little cut on his chin. Well, a guy broke my rib, and nobody talks about that. So, no, I don't feel so bad about it. So, that's Gretzky's point of view on it. Uh, unfortunately, Gretzky... Uh, Gretzky ended up scoring the winner that night and then getting five points in what he describes as the best game he ever played in Game 7 to go to the Stanley Cup Final. Uh, they lost there to the Montreal Canadiens as their last Stanley Cup ever. So, what Terry Fraser says in his book is, Game 6 was in overtime, tied at 4, and the Leafs were down a man since Glenn Anderson was serving a boring penalty. About a minute into overtime, King's defenseman Rob Blake at the right point passed the puck forward along the boards to Wayne Gretzky. Gretzky's shot from the top of the face but face off uh, circle was blocked by defenseman Jamie McCoon. Gretzky and Leaf center Doug Gilmore both went after the loose puck and Gilmore fell to the ice injured. As a referee, the biggest fear I've always had is that when I blink, something could occur in that fraction of the second that I will miss. It's always uncomfortable when a player simply passes in front of your line of vision. You worry something fateful might occur. Was this one such moment? There was an aching in the pit of my gut, a feeling of helplessness, a sensation so awful I wanted to throw up. And then he says, my initial thought was that some old uh, scar tissue had been scraped off after Gilmore approached him. God knows, Killer had enough of that on his face. Next I asked him what happened. Doug said, Wayne took a shot and the follow through struck me on the chin. To which I responded, if that's the case, a normal follow through of a shot is not a penalty. Because contact made when a shooter is falling through is except from a penalty for high sticking. Dud said, okay. He accepted that no penalty was warranted. I then noticed that Gretzky had drifted away from the scene of the crime. Quotations. Unusual for him, since he was normally right there to provide input when necessary. Upon reflection, that might have been an admission of guilt on Wayne's part. A sign he thought he was about to receive a four minute double minor for high sticking. My next course of action was to appeal to both linesmen and hope that, from one of their points, they could give me accurate information about what happened. Unfortunately, Ron Finn and Kevin Collins, who were, that, who were the linesmen that night, uh, did not uh, have any help to offer. So, at that moment, I came to understand, Kerry Fraser speaking, that in hockey officiating, it's not always black and white. And so he did not... Uh, he did not call the penalty. For most of my career, he says, video review of plays wasn't even technically feasible. And even today, it is not allowed for a penalty call. So the play was over and gone. Lost that split second of time and space that seemed like an eternity once Gilmore's blood started to drip. And then Gretzky scored the game winner. The series was tied, and then Gretzky dominated the last game to get them to the Stanley Cup final. So what do you think, Josiah? I'm not sure. I don't know. I mean, like, yeah, the Leafs would probably be pretty angry about that. Because now, they, you know, it should have been a four-minute penalty in an overtime. Was it, well, did they play five on, was it five on five they would have been playing? Uh, not then, because Len Anderson, who was a Leaf, had mm -hmm. taken up board and penalty. So. No, I mean, did they play five on, so they, it would have been five on four? Or no, five, no so it, it would have been four on four, yeah. And then they would have had a five and four power play advantage, but that probably would have helped them. But you know, refs make calls; they make bad calls. But you know, without the refs, there would be a lot of turmoil. 
But, you know, you yeah. guys, you blame everything on the rest. That's kind of how it works. But the Leafs, they, it, the Leafs fans exaggerated this so much. Uh, Fraser said, I went to bed, and the next morning caught a flight home to Philly. The next day at about 6 p.m., I woke to my parents at their home in Sarnia. That's when I heard that my father had been awakened between 4 and 5 a.m. to the sound of one car hitting another in his driveway. Looking out the window, he, window, he saw a vehicle continually backing up and ramming into a trailer hit, hitch of his mini motorhome parked in the driveway. Clad only in his tidy whities he grabbed an ex- Axe from the next to the back, from next to the back door, and chased the motorist up the street. I was livid. I was furious that someone would take out their hostility on my family. The next call I made was to NHL security, who investigated and later informed me that the vandal was a Leafs fan from Kinnisher Waterloo, who had made the 90-mile drive to the house to the homestead just to do that. They also experienced many crank calls. This prompted my mother to answer the phone with the referee's whistle poised at the ready to shatter the eardrums of anyone who dared invade their privacy. So not only was a trailer hitch repeatedly run into because of that call, uh, they got many crank calls. So I would be, at this point, I would have been completely ashamed to be a Leafs fan because just ma- massive over-exaggeration. Yeah. I mean, I guess that missed call came back to bite them in uh, later on in the Stanley Cup final when Marty Mitsorley had the illegal stick that changed the Montreal series around. But yeah. that's that's for a different podcast. So I think you there is no way you can blame this on Fraser. And personally, this part of it is particularly meant for Leafs fans. So we have the linesman. Couldn't see the play at all. Yep. Gretzky knew that he had high stick, but he wasn't obviously going to say anything. Gilmore thought he was hit with a puck, so he didn't even think that he was high stick, and he agreed with no penalty being called. So where in the proof of that is could there possibly be a penalty? Upon further further review the next day, that yeah, it was obvious that it was a penalty, but Fraser did not have that look at it. Neither did the linesman, and even and even Gilmore didn't know that that had happened. So it's kind of funny Fra- though. Fraser didn't have any evidence, and he can't call a penalty just because Gretzky is staying away from the play because he thinks that he's guilty or knows that he's guilty of a high stick. <laughs> it's kind of funny though that Gilmore doesn't even know how he got injured himself. Yeah, yeah, so he was he was fine with it. You can't even say Gilmore was upset. So. I personally think he can't blame this on Fraser, or the linesman, or Gilmore, or, like, or like only blame Gretzky, really. But even Gretzky, it's yeah. like, it, it, you can't expect a player to, like, tell the ref, okay, I took this penalty. Like, that just, that doesn't happen. Yeah, no. So, I just think that it was kind of a no-win situation for Fraser in that, and I feel bad for him and his family that they had to go through that just because of some angry Leafs fans when it wasn't even his fault. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, hopefully that settles the debate for a lot of angry Leafs fans, <laughs> possibly. Uh, you yeah. should probably try to let it go as it's been almost 30 years since that happened. If you're, so, if you're a bachelor and you one one day One day they'll be good again. Yeah, if you're a bachelor and you're listening to this and you spent you wasted thirty years or almost of your life about this call, just don't worry about it. Become an Oilers fan. It's a lot better. <laughs> advice, advice just from a guy. A- advice from a guy who says that they haven't. They've only reached the playoffs once since two thousand six. So yeah, it's I don't. Well, know. they wouldn't have made the playoffs this year, but the Canucks they might have not made the playoffs. No, they're in a playoff spot right now. No, they're not, actually. Yeah, they would. I don't think they are. Yes, they are. All right, let's see. Okay. Uh, so, this is our story the, uh, for the day. The Elitzer of Hockey. I'm not sure how to say it. So, uh, it's about the New York Rangers, so the Broadway Blue Shirts, as they were called. Uh, and it's placed in 1950-51. So, just months after coming within a whisker of winning the Stanley Cup, the Broadway Blues were floating under the five the five hundred mark and were in real danger of missing the playoffs. Uh, as every Rangers fan knew that if you could get a ticket to the dance, you could still be walt- waltzing late into the postseason night. Oh, and just for those of you that are Canucks fans, the Canucks are currently not in a playoff spot. 
So I told they were misinformation. They are not in the playoffs, but anyways. It took a local restaurant owner named Jean Leon and a clever sports writer named Jim Bouchard to come up with the formula to save the blue shirts. Uh, since they were huge Ranger fans, Leon and Bouchard decided to create a wonder drink that would pull the Rangers out from the dual drums and propel them towards the Stanley Cup playoffs. And hey, he figured, it would provide a public re relations boost for his fledgling bar, and he would boost the spirits of Broadway's favorite Ice Time boys. So he went to work, uh, creating a mixture of delicious fruit juices and an ounce or two of, vint of vintage wine, so that he could produce the formula that would pour... That would cure the Rangers blues. Over the Christmas holidays, he and his now so newspaper crony perfected their conception, poured it into a huge black bottle, and presented it to the playoffs as the cure to end all ills. Uh, they must have had like some sort of magic salesman power or something because they convinced Ranger standouts like Don Bones Raleigh, Petit. Lund, Frankie Ed Edels, Neil Colville, and Zilio Tepazini, they had such real uh, weird names back then, uh, to decide to take the brew without question or hesitation. Uh, it was just amazing. After, right after that, they went on a win streak. The Rangers won 10 of their next 12 games, and as each victory was penciled into the record book, more and more attention was being shifted toward this miraculous medicine that was taking the team to the top of the charts. More and more queries were being directed toward its mysterious content. Leon insisted that the formula was a secret, but he didn't divulge the manner in which it was delivered. The secret was that the secret formula could be prepared only at the last minute to ensure its full power. He told the press and everyone else who would listen since his restaurant was going great, guns, that when the preparations were completed and the revenue was ready, it was given to Bouchard. He would then board a plane with the miracle worker safely secured in a black bag, kept all warm and cozy and surrounded by a trio of hot water bottles that kept it fresh and happy. There was still one special and all-important test left to prove the power of the potion. The Rangers were about to embark on a true test of the metal of the matter when they journeyed to Toronto to battle the Maple Leafs, a squad that always caused them pain, scorn, and any other noun you would like to insert. If Leon's formula really was a real deal, it would have to make the Leafs fall. Well, by this time the whole thing had become a circus. Not since uh, Turk Brodo was delegated to the Fat Farm that had anything so novel put the game of hockey back on the front pages of the daily newspapers. Well, the Leafs actually had a plan of their own. They arranged for Canada custom agents to, agencies to seize the bottle. Since Bouchard would not reveal its secret contents, the Leafs contended that the bottle could, can, could, could contain something lethal or, per, or perhaps even a bomb. However, Lyon and Bouchard had a few more allies in the fifth estate than the Leafs realized, and they were clued in on the ploy. Bouchard cleverly enticed a Toronto Globe and Mail photographer to distract the custom agents with a tasty uh, bribe of Christmas cigars and brandy while he slipped by, booty and all. Bouchard rushed to Maple Leafs Gardens and arrived just in time to deliver the solution and have the lads drink the potion. Imagine the surprise on their interprayers' uh, faces when the Broadway boys went out and played like a team possessed. The lads uh, pasted three putts past the Leafs and held on to post a 4-2 victory that night. By the time the rapid rise was becoming a rocket, business at Leon's place was so brisk he couldn't even find the time to conceive new, pat new batches of the stuff, which was quickly becoming an issue, since everyone from scientists to doctors to religious Quack speculated on exactly what was in the Broadway bubbly. And really, here's where the boys start sinking their own ship. When, Le when Leon announced that he was going to sell a secret solution to the public, the vocal ma majority started chirping. Well, a sports team will use anything, real or imagined, to pull some itself out of the sun. It was quite another thing for that special solution to be offered to Joe Public. Naysayers started spilling out of the woodwork. Some who choked back the Surrey sap said it reminded them of bad chicken soup on a very bad day. Others said it had the aroma of the Atlantic Ocean. Even some of the Rangers themselves said Bowfoot was beyond their capa capacity to describe. And they were winning. But some still believed, at least for a little while. But when Leon was too busy to deliver the solution, the losses started to outnumber the wins. Even when the uh, the medicine, quote, quotations, did show up, it didn't seem to kick in. 
and quickly the fad was dead. And so were the Rangers. They finished fifth out of the playoffs and out of luck. So remember, there are no magic solutions to success. It's all hard work and good luck. What do you think of that story, Josiah? It was definitely a long story. story. Yeah, it's just there's no. I I've, I've always believed that there's no such thing as good or or bad luck. So I don't believe that that would ever work. I think they were just trying to get money and hopefully help the Rangers in the process. And it's just a coincidence that they were starting to win at that time. Uh, and it ended up that what failed what failed the potion was the them getting too ahead of themselves. Okay. Okay, so that is it for the J&J Hockey Podcast for today. We hope you enjoyed it. Remember to, as we said before, wash your, wash your hands. Um, don't touch your face. Just and cough on your friends. Okay. No, I'm just Famous last words. Bye. Talk to you guys later. Bye-bye.